now presenting will be Pedro Jacob. So Pedro completed his PhD in zoology in the University of uh, Cambridge and describing the diversity of song patterns um, uh, generator neurons in different cricket species and their species specific activities. He's currently doing his postdoc with Scott Wardell at the University of Oxford, exploring the neuronal mechanisms underlying behavioral flexibility and the integration of information about conflicting events in flies. So again, moving to dopamine in Drosophila, and uh, we'll hear a little bit about safety memories. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, we can. Um, can you hear me? Uh, okay, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to present my work um, and to the organizers of this interesting uh, symposium. Uh, so like uh, like you uh, said, I'm a postdoc in Scott's Waddle lab and uh, what I'm interested in is understanding the neural mechanisms underlying behavioral flexibility and the use flies um, to, to do this. Uh, this work was uh, recently published in Neuron, so if you want to find more details, you can look through through the paper. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is how uh, aversive memories form from two complementary uh, uh, memories of opposite valences in flies. So uh, what is now considered classic uh, psychological studies uh, in psychology, Hermann Himbingaus in the late 19th century uh, showed that b uh, by studying a set of nonsense uh, syllable lists, where he would rehearse these lists in a spaced and repetitive manner, he could remember them better than actually uh, uh, join the, all these training sessions in one single time. So this led to the concept of space training helps, helping to form long-term memories. Uh, then, uh, across the, the years, uh, space training was uh, shown to be important to also to uh, better recall of other skills like uh, general knowledge, um, facts, uh, motor skills, and gen uh, generalizing uh, conceptual knowledge in children. But interestingly, space training is a, a common phenomenon across the animal kingdom. And uh, flies and other invertebrates also express uh, this uh, effectiveness of space training being uh, better to form long-term memories. CS plus memory. Uh, and to test this, what we would present is we train with the order uh, as a CS plus and then another order as a CS minus, but then in the behavioral choice, we give them a novel order so they, that they never experience. So this would be to evaluate exactly the CS plus memory. And in contrast, to evaluate the CS minus memory, we would present the, the CS minus order versus a novel order during the behavioral choice. So what we could see here uh, is that uh, exactly the same that I showed you before, but at 24 hour memory, uh, after space training, flies can exhibit a, a negative performance index showing a, a preference to avoid the, the shock odor. But interestingly, if we uh, uh, just test the CS plus versus a novel odor, we could see a significantly different uh, memory performance. Um, in contrast to, to the CS plus versus CS minus memory performance. Uh, so that meaning that the CS plus memory corresponds to part of the this 24 hour memory. But more interestingly, what we observe is that by testing the CS minus versus an awful odor, we could see an approach to the CS minus odor. So meaning that the space training also forms a CS minus approach memory that has a positive valence. So the flies would prefer uh, this uh, CS minus over a novel order. So 
given the, the arrangement of the, the, the space trading paradigm, we wonder if the order between the CS plus and the CS minus would be important for the formation of this approach memory. And for this, what we did is uh, we did a six uh, space training cycles, but instead of presenting the CS plus first, we reverted the order. So we would present the CS minus first, and then only then the, the CS plus pair with the shock. This would be, this would be uh, helpful to evaluate if the flies would, uh, in this way, cannot gain uh, any information about the previous uh, order being paired with shock. And what we could see here when we evaluate the different types of memories is that the CS plus memories is still formed in this, uh, in this arrangement when the CS plus and CS minus are inverted but we don't see uh, any a, a positive approach memory to the CS minus. So meaning that the, the CS minus approach memory requires the appropriate order of the CS plus and the CS minus. Then we'll, the other characteristic of um, space training is this rest intervals. Uh, so we wonder if this is important to generate this uh, positive approach memory. And for this, we use what is classically known as mass training and where we do the six training trials, but these training trials are uh, always temporally one after the other without any rest intervals. Uh, here we use the, the, the normal confirmation with the CS plus first and then the CS minus. And again, evaluating the, 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 the different types of memories, what we could saw is that the CS plus memory is still uh, formed after the mass training, but again, the CS minus uh, memory is gone, meaning that the CS minus approach memory requires the rest intervals to be formed. The, the final uh, question was that the requirement for multiple training trials to form this CS minus approach memory. Here, we change slightly the protocol because we know that in flies, if we only train by uh, one time with one training cycle, we couldn't form a persistent 24-hour uh, memory. However, if we do a protocol that to, in the field is known as fasting LTM, where the flies are stars between 12 and 16 hours before the training, the, this one training cycle, and then trained, and then refab until test, uh, it's known to form a 24-hour memory. And what we saw is that, indeed, this, uh, this protocol works, forming this 24-hour uh, uh, memory. Again, testing the CS plus memory. This CS plus memory is not different from the, 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 when you test CS plus versus CS minus memory. But again, there is no CS minus approach memory. What, which means that the CS minus approach memory is only formed after repetitive trials. Then what we try to do is to generate a, a timeline of these two memories. Uh, this is a timeline that we evaluate different time points uh, after training uh, and the, the performance index. This is the memory when we test CS plus versus CS minus. Uh, and characteristically, it starts uh, very high initially, decays quite quickly during the first 14 hours, and then uh, stabilizes after that. And is still, uh, there is uh, an avoidance memory being uh, present at 96 hours. The, the CS plus uh, memory uh, also had this time uh, decay, where very quickly decays uh, to 14 hours, but interestingly, at 96 hours, it's not observed uh, this uh, CS plus uh, memory. However, the, the approach memory to the CS minus uh, shows a, a very different dynamics. It's very slow, slowly emerging, uh, being, only, uh, being almost, uh, only statistically significantly from zero at 14 hours, but lasts for much longer than the CS plus memory being uh, stable up to 96 hours. So this indicates that in this CS minus memory is indeed a, for, uh, a form of long-term memory. And one of the wallmarks of long-term memory is being dependent on protein synthesis. So to test this, we use uh, a protein synthesis inhibitor called the cyclohexamide. 
uh, year, uh, year uh, reported at CXM. So we fed the flies before and the trading cycle and test for the uh, then uh, train them for six space cycles and refeed them uh, with normal food until test. And what we could see is that if we test CS minus versus CS plus memory, we indeed uh, the protein the protein synthesis depend um, protein synthesis inhibitor fat flies with cyclohexamide show uh, a, a decrease in memory performance at 24 hours. But this is not observed uh, a statistically significant difference between the CS plus memory and the controls here in gray. But what we got is a very strong uh, uh, impairment of the CS minus approach memory uh, in cyclohexamide um, fed animals. So uh, pointing towards the, that this CS minus approach memory is a, a form of protein synthesis dependent memory. But we wonder also if, uh, because this arrangement of CS plus CS minus means that uh, the CS minus always follows the presence of uh, a shock. And this could be a form of uh, a persistent form of relief learning. And we know that invertebrates, safety memory and relief learning or relief memory are two different, uh, two different types of memory and re require different neurosubstrates. Uh, but there are ways to test the, this difference between safety and relief. And one of them is to increase the interstimulus interval between the, 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 um, the stimuli and see the effect on, on memory performance. And that's what we did. So if we, uh, again, with the space training protocol, we, we present the CS plus, but then vary the, the interstimulus interval between 45 seconds and three minutes, we see that the, the flies can avoid equally well uh, the, the, the CS plus odor. And also, if we test for the CS minus memory, we could see that even at three minutes separation, the, the flies still uh, tend to approach significantly the, the, the CS minus, um, the CS minus uh, memory. However, if we do a, a relief training protocol where it's, the shock is, uh, is presented alone, and then after a, a period of time, we present an, uh, an odor, and then test for the, the, the preference for this odor versus a novel, we see that this preference is only observed uh, with the interstimulus interval that go up, uh, up to 90 seconds. So if we extend to 135 seconds, this uh, preference is gone. And one more important point is that the relief learning uh, paradigm is only observed immediately after training in contrast to the, to the CS minus approach memory where is observed up to 96 hours after training. So we believe that safety memory is, uh, this CS minus approach memory is not a, uh, a relief, but instead is an actual safety memory to the impaired odor. Uh, and so the, the main conclusion of this first behavioral part is that to show that aversive space training forms a persistent safety memory. So we, uh, the mushroom body is the center for associative learning in flies. Uh, the, uh, each, uh, the mushroom body is composed by third order uh, olfactory neurons that receive uh, excitatory um, connections from the olfactory pathway. They are roughly parallel cells uh, with um, 2000 parallel cells uh, in each hemisphere that uh, project to the lobes of the mushroom body and connect to um, output neurons of the mushroom body and also dopaminergic neurons. And are these dopaminergic neurons that are indeed important to modulate the, 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 learn the learning in the fly. Uh, so uh, we have the, the great advantage in flies that we have genetic tools that can target different uh, dopaminergic neurons. So here we have a reconstruction of each uh, dopaminergic neuron in the fly brain done by ASO and collaborators in Geneva Research Campus. And what you can see is that each dopaminergic neuron innervates a very specific compartment of the mushroom body, tiling uh, its presynaptic terminals, tiling all the different lobes of the mushroom body. You can see here then. So this is a very precise uh, um, 
genetic tools that we can then ex uh, use to explore the the different uh, the different roles of these dopaminergic neurons in 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 behavior. So taking an advantage uh, of this, we, we know a lot now about uh, the the how learning happens in the flies. So we believe that recurrent dopaminergic circuits are the main uh, domains of uh, learning in flies, where uh, punishment dopaminergic neurons innervate specific regions of the, uh, the mushroom body, mainly the vertical lobe and the peduncle here uh, of the mushroom body, while reward dopaminergic neurons tend to innervate the horizontal lobes of the mushroom body. And this, uh, there is a, also a clear separation between the punishment dopaminergic neurons innervating the uh, the dendro uh, dendrites of what we call approach output neurons uh, here uh, represented the uh, bonds and these approach out uh, output neurons uh, tend to guide when activated the approach to the other but since the learning rule in um, in fly is the depression uh, leads uh, is the depression when activation of dopaminergic neurons what happens is that uh, this uh, connection between the older specific activation and the output neurons is reduced. And by reducing this, uh, this act activity to the approach dopaminergic neurons, uh, we generate uh, a reduced uh, approach and then tends to skew the, the, the training, uh, the, the fly to more avoidance to the, the order that was paired with the shock. And the other uh, way around for reward uh, that that innervate regions that we call the avoidance output neurons. So the important thing is to learn is that uh, they have uh, different uh, different op uh, opposite signals where the punishment uh, depresses the activity of approach dopaminergic neurons and the reward dopaminergic neurons depress the activity of avoidance uh, output neurons. So we wondered what dopaminergic neurons could mediate this safety memory is that the safety memory can be uh, coded as a, a reward. And what we saw is that taking advantage of the, the precise nature of these genetic tools developed by ASO and collaborators, uh, collaborators we, we can target a very specific, uh, every population of uh, dopaminergic neurons. And using uh, a, a thermogenetic tool uh, called Shibiri, that when it, the, the temperature is raised above 29 degrees, what you can see is that we block the synaptic release uh, uh, of, the, um, of the neurons and then block their activity. So by raising the temperature during training uh, to 33 degrees and train the flies uh, at 33 degrees, we could block the activity during training and then reestablish the activity of these neurons by lowering the temperature up to test and then testing at room temperature. So if we target the activity of uh, the major uh, punishment of energetic neurons here in red in the vertical loop, we could see that in this uh, second column, we could see that the dopaminergic neurons for aversive, uh, when blocked, uh, impair the memory formation in comparison to the controls here in gray but specifically they impair the formation of this CS plus uh, memory to the, to the order that was paired with shock, and, but no effect on the CS minus memory. However, if we look at different uh, uh, reward dopaminergic neurons, namely the gamma three, beta prime one and beta prime two, we could see interest, very interesting effects. So if we target the gamma three dopaminergic neuron and block it, uh, we could see that this neuron uh, doesn't affect the CS minus versus CS plus memory, but it has a very specific and strong effect to the CS minus approach memory. And again, does, uh, again, uh, being involved in the CS minus memory, the beta prime two and beta prime one uh, neurons are also uh, important to target the CS minus memory. So blocking these neurons, we could lose the CS minus approach memory but interestingly, they never affect the, the CS plus uh, versus memory. So it's a very specific uh, specific role for this uh, reward dopaminergic neurons in the CS minus memory and the punishment dopaminergic neurons 
to the CS plus memory. So given this uh, nice dichotomy between uh, in one hand CS plus uh, memory being uh, involved uh, dopaminergic neurons that code for punishment and the safety memory involve, uh, involving uh, reward dopaminergic neurons, we wonder if there is a, a parallel memory network could account for this uh, long-term memory. And to test this, what we do is to record the activity of different uh, dopaminergic neurons and output uh, neurons from the mushroom body under the microscope, uh, where we can uh, evaluate the activity of these neurons during training or after training by also pairing an odor with a shock, with a shock under the microscope, and then record their activity, uh, their activity at different time points. So starting by looking at these dopaminergic neurons that uh, are called delta 3 dopaminergic neurons, we, the interest, one interesting fact is that this, although in the reward cluster, they respond very strongly to shocks. So here we have the, a shock presentation, and these are the response to each, uh, uh, to each shock during a trial. Uh, and then this is the average between trials. Uh, and we see this is a, a quite an interesting um, a phenomenon that other people also observe that these dopaminergic neurons seem to respond very strongly to shocks. And interestingly, this uh, dopaminergic neuron also responds very strongly to uh, the CS plus other response. And if we evaluate other evoke responses after training, we could see that the CS plus other evoke responses were in, uh, increased over the CS minus. Uh, other evoke responses. So in this uh, gamma-3 dopaminergic neurons, these synapse plus responses uh, um, are increased after training and during training as well. Then if you look at another class of dopaminergic neurons, the beta prime dopaminergic neurons, they seem not to respond to shocks at all. But what happens is that the, the, their responses in the beta prime one become more selective to the CS minus during space training. So uh, if we evaluate the, the, the other evoke responses between CS plus and CS minus after training, we could see an increase uh, other evoke responses to the CS minus. The other class of dopaminergic neurons, this beta prime two, responds mildly to shocks, uh, although uh, not as strongly as gamma three but as also an interesting uh, phenomenon that the beta prime two dopaminergic neurons seems to gain overtraining uh, and uh, uh, increased response to the CS minus. So after the, the, sixth, the sixth training trial, we could see a significant difference between the, uh, the CS plus response in comparison to the CS minus response. And if we evaluate only the other evoke responses uh, uh, before and uh, before and after training, we could see that the CS minus uh, other evoke responses are increased over the CS plus responses. So we know that these neurons uh, innervate different compartments that, that have the dendrites of this uh, called M bonds. So the next step was to evaluate if the synaptic depression uh, that we think uh, is involved in the learning rule uh, of uh, in Drosophila is also observed in the output neurons. So this is again a video from Azo uh, and, and collaborators where they develop these uh, tools also to target specifically the output neurons. And if you could um, see, uh, it's difficult to see here, but uh, every dopaminergic neuron, the for example, the gamma three, uh, innervates a very specific region of the, the mushroom body. And what we could see here is a is a is a, recon, uh, a reconstruction of the of the mushroom uh, the, the output neurons in the gamma three and beta prime region, done by Nils Nils Otto in the lab in the connectomics uh, uh, effort between University of Oxford, Cambridge, and uh, Geneva Research Campus. And interestingly, this M bond that are innervated by these two uh, uh, different dopaminergic neurons. Uh, have a very specific uh, arrangement, and the, uh, it's uh, they have different in the different sides of the brain. They have different uh, dendritic uh, dendritic fields. 
but it is interestingly that this M bond is both uh, innervated by appetitively reinforced dance and aversively reinforcing dance. So we wonder that if given this, uh, the, this different in this, uh, the dendritic fields, could we actually see um, a different uh, region specific plasticity uh, in the two different regions? And indeed, when we look at the beta prime one dendritic field of this uh, output neuron, we could see that indeed the other evoke responses to the CS minus were depressed in comparison to the CS plus. Whereas when we look at the gamma three dendritic field, what we could see is a, a depression to the CS plus uh, over the CS minus. So uh, indeed, this uh, this M bond shows a region specific plasticity in the dendrites. And which makes sense with a beta prime one dendritic field responding uh, more to the to the CS minus uh, dance, and whereas in the gamma three dance there is an increased response to the CS plus. And given that the the learning rule is depression, uh, increase in uh, dopaminergic neurons activity leads to a depression in the uh, the downstream output neurons. But given that this, two, this output neuron is integrated uh, upstream in the presynaptic terminals, we also image uh, this, uh, this region of the output neuron. And in this uh, case, what we found is that the neuron seems to integrate the activity uh, of these two reg uh, specific regions. Since we, after training, we couldn't see a difference between the CS plus and the CS minus. And this is interesting because we think that this neuron might be coding relative safety. So meaning that if one of the, one of the plasticities is uh, strongly depressed in comparison to the other, this, uh, imagine the beta prime one is strongly depressed uh, to the CS minus, this would toggle the, the, the neuron to be more uh, depressed to the CS minus in comparison the, to the CS plus. So this is an interesting um, observation that this M1 seems to be coding relative safety. One more interesting uh, observation is that uh, in the connectomics efforts uh, by Neil Zotto is that gamma three beta prime one M1 is a GABAergic neuron. And we could see here in red and blue, uh, light blue is the, the gamma three beta prime one M1. And they have strong inputs to the other class of output neurons uh, that I implicated with my studies in uh, dopaminergic neurons. So the beta prime two region, that is this dark blue neuron here, the, this, uh, this M1, the gamma three beta prime one, has strong inputs to this one. So what we think is that it could be a release of feed forward inhibition uh, from this gamma three beta prime one to this beta prime two to allow the formation of safety memory. So the, 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 the hypothesis would be that we also could see a plasticity in this output neuron uh, after space training. And indeed, if we, um, if we look at this output neuron, the here in, um, in uh, yellow, we, we could see that the CS minus, uh, the CS minus um, uh, odor evoke responses are depressed after training in comparison to the CS plus. And this, uh, this makes sense because this output neuron is known to code avoidance. So by having a depressed response to the CS minus, there is less uh, depression to um, less, less avoidance to the CS minus. So uh, in general terms, this would skew for more approach to the CS minus. But uh, to, uh, to contrast with one approach promoting neuron, that is known to be innervated by these punishment dopaminergic neurons, we see that this approach, uh, approach output neuron is uh, strongly depressed to CS plus, uh, what you can see in comparison to the CS minus. So uh, following again the, the rule of uh, depression, we see that uh, by depressing the activity to the CS plus, this reduces approaches and then uh, favors an avoidance uh, to to the output neuron. So what we think is that space training indeed forms complementary parallel memories uh, during, uh, during space training, whereas uh, these uh, horizontal lines would represent the canyon cells. And once an odor uh, sparsely activates the canyon cells 
specific group of Kenyan cells. Uh, and during aversive learning, where the, when the CS plus odor comes, uh, there is a, a, an activity of the punishment of energetic neurons that contact specifically this approach arm of the mushroom body. Whereas during uh, the presentation of the CS minus odor that activates a different subset of Kenyan cells, uh, this uh, CS minus odor uh, and the activation of reward of energetic neurons uh, modifies the activity uh, of the avoidance arm of the mushroom body. And after learning, what happens is that the CS plus odor, by depressing the, the connection between the canyon cells here uh, or in, in horizontal lines and the output connections uh, here in blue, is who, what means is that this would reduce the approach uh, to the CS plus odor, whereas uh, where the CS minus odor reduces the activity to avoid this coding output neurons, and by uh, reducing this avoidance, favors the approach to the CS minus odor. So, in a more simplistic way, we see that space training forms complementary flies, and fly uh, in flies and flies not only know to avoid the CS plus odor, uh, uh, but also knows that the CS plus CS minus odor is also a safe, a safe odor. So this would make the, 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 uh, its decision much more certain uh, in behavior. So uh, as a summary, uh, I hope I convince you that after differential space training, flies form parallel complementary memories for the CS plus and avoidance memory and for the CS minus as an approach safety memory, that the CS minus safety memory is a protein synthesis dependent uh, LTM uh, that the gamma-3, beta-prime-1, and beta-prime-2 dopaminergic neurons reinforce the delay recognition of safety, and this by the depressing the connections to output neurons in the mushroom body that leads to the, the, this uh, avoidance or approach behavior being increased, and forming parallel memories for the two others may, makes their subsequent decision much more certain. So finally, I'd like to thank uh, Scott Waddle, my supervisor, also, key people in, that were previously in the lab, Johannes Fosenberg and Manu Pires, for help in discussion and setup uh, building. And also, Zainab Yokurai, Nils Otto, and Annie Park for help during the presentation and the preparing some figures. And thank you, all of you, for your attention. Great. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, just for the audience, I'm not getting any questions, so you are all welcome to email me directly if you would like to um, to ask any questions. So my e I put it in the chat, but I think you are not seeing it. Uh, it's adae at umich.edu, adae at umich.edu if you want to, to email me any questions. Uh, or maybe the chat is actually working. I just got... Um, a message, so you can also try uh, putting question in the chat. Okay, so thank you again for um, the great talk. I'm wondering, um, are the safe neurons uh, specific to safely in the context of uh, fear, or would these same neurons be activated um, in the context of reward learning, or just if animal um, hear sounds that don't predict anything? Yeah, so. Uh, this, uh, there is a specific, uh, a specific. Um, these neurons are. There is a, a slightly uh, different dopaminergic neurons can uh, code for different rewards like water in a thirsty animal or sugar in a hungry animal. Uh, hungry animal, and also these neurons uh, can also be coding for safety. So there is a, a huge diversity of dopaminergic neurons in, in the reward side that code for different specific different uh, rewards. Yeah. So those will not be uh, modulated by reward per se? Uh, the, some of them can be, uh, but not all of them. So it's uh, a sparse population is. Great, thanks. So questions started to come in. So um, Benko is asking a question. First, uh, commenting it's a great work, and he's saying that the data is done on wild type flies. So, did you try any LTM or ARM mutant such as Kramer or Tequila? Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, is it the screen share also? Um, so can you see my screen? Hey, it's the same. Sorry, can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we, we, what we try is uh, use the radish mutant that is known to uh, to affect uh, arm. And wait, let me just try to find. So here. Uh, this radish mutant that we know that uh, affect uh, this arm uh, memory, um, and we what we saw is that the it indeed affects the CS um, CS minus versus CS plus memory, but has a very specific effect on the CS plus uh, memory, but not in the CS minus memory. So we try this um, this mutants uh, called radish. Yes. Great. Uh, and another question, uh, you showed the, the result regarding the chemogenetic inhibition of the um, aversive uh, CS plus neurons, uh, mm -hmm. or, or the neurons that respond to the uh, aversive cues. Um, did you try to inhibit the ones which are responding to the safety and see what is it resulting? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Um, so with the chemogenetic inhibition, you inhibited the population that is responding to the CS plus, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Is the trial also inhibiting the one which is responding to the CS minus? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, by uh, inhibiting uh, all the cluster of the reward dopaminergic neurons, like here, we could see uh, that this is a very specific effect to the CS minus um, and, and not to the CS plus. And uh, more more precisely, if we if we just uh, using a optogenetic tool, uh, optogenetic tool to the CS um, to the to block to selectively inhibit only during the presentation of the CS minus and blocking the reward of magic neurons, we could affect only the uh, we could see a strong defect on the long term memory. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so another question arise. Um, so in humans, there is some work showing that dopamine would be less or not involved in learning by punishment. Could you say anything about that? Do you think this avoid approach, the A-mediated effect is conserved in mammals? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the the... Do, because it's known that uh, uh, different uh, different regions of the brain in mammals code for this safety. So I would I would assume that this kind of approach safety memory is also conserved uh, in mammals. Yes. Yeah. And I think there is another question: uh, What is radish mutant? If, uh, before so radish mutant is a small GTPase. Uh, small GTPAs, Yeah. It's, it's a mutation for the small GTPAs uh, in, the, in the brain of the fly, yeah. Great, thank you very much again for a great talk. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Rebecca, did you, are you continuing from here?